Good afternoon, everyone. We are live from the Clifford Still Museum. My name is Dean Sobel. I'm the director here. We are in the southwest corner of the museum to unroll what will be the final three rolls of our extensive inventory of Clifford Still's magnificent paintings. I want to introduce to you first the team, uh, those who have been actively involved in this project, certainly more actively than I uh, have been, so please come and join me. Uh, first of all, to my left is Emily Kazakowski, our registrar, who will say a few words about what she does in a minute. Um, immediately to my right are our two paintings conservators, James Squires and Pam Skiles. Pam is actually here on a joint Mellon-funded position that we share with the Denver Art Museum. So she's been here for only half of the fun. And then also to my left is Associate Curator Bailey Plotchek. Uh, why don't I give you a little bit of background for those of you that are just getting caught up in the story of the Clifford Still collection. Uh, in 1951, Still effectively removed himself from the art world. He was still um, painting some of his greatest paintings. He was still involved with friendships at that point with other abstract expressionists. But he decided he was going to manage his career in his own way. Uh, by the time of his death in 1980, he had amassed what we believe to be the most intact body of work of any major artist from any century then or even to this day. And his will specified that everything he had in his possession would be given to an American city who would build permanent quarters for it. Uh, in 2004, we were able to announce that Denver had won that competition. And in 2011, we opened the museum to the public with about 50 paintings and 50 drawings. And then over the course of early 2012, through a series of art transport uh, shuttles, we brought what turned out to be 231 rolls of Clifford Still's remaining paintings. And that's the process we've been working on over the last six or so years. For us here as part of the team, this is actually really exciting. Uh, a little heartbreaking, I suppose, at the same time. Uh, but the six paintings, roughly six paintings we're all going to see today will be the end of that effort. Um, I want to really stress how unusual this activity is for museums. Usually uh, you will have paintings come in to collections stretch. Maybe here and there you'll have large contemporary paintings rolled and conservators and others would need to prepare those paintings for accessibility. But the volume and the unknown nature of our work is quite unusual and quite special and something that I think has given us a lot of wind uh, in our sails as we go through this work. Um, we're going to encourage questions vis-a-vis -vis the Facebook Live site. So uh, we have people monitoring those questions and we'll try to answer as many as we have time for. And I will tell you we're going to move rather quickly and as we're doing some of this work we'll touch on some of the things that we're not going to show you today. For example, um, flipping the paintings open, over and measuring is something that just isn't ra ra rather filmic. So we're going to skip those parts. But I think this is a good time to get a little bit more information from our register, Emily, if you'll join me again, and I'll ask my colleagues to uh, grab the first role. Um, first of all, Emily, what do registrars do in art museums? It sounds like something in a hospital or a college, uh, college undergraduate program. <laughs> so um, a very important part of my job is to do risk management and documentation of the collection. So, um, that is what drives the inventory process. We, we um, have had upwards of 12 to 13 canvases on a single roll. So in terms of your work and the responsibilities you have, what's that like trying to keep track of multiple canvases on multiple rolls over multiple years in multiple rooms, I suppose? Well, fortunately, we have a great database that we use. Um, and the stills themselves provided us with extensive lists and pictures and uh, lots of documentation of the collection. But our job is to verify exactly what's in the collection, where it is at any given time. When Once they're unrolled, we are taking snapshots, we're measuring, we are taking down inscription information, and all of this lends um, 
lends itself to us taking care of the collection and certainly keeping track of where it is. Great. We're going to touch base with the other um, team members in a second, but why don't we start this work? Again, this is a kind of well-rehearsed process for us. We've uh, done 228 rolls up until this point. Uh, you'll notice perhaps first the stills uh, wrapped each one of the rolls either in brown paper, I think another one of the rolls is in plastic, and they did us the favor of including, uh, you'll see on Pam's end of the table, these um, hand-drawn schematics of the contents of the works on the roll. We're not sure if that's Patricia still, Still's uh, second wife, or the artist himself, but they have proven to be very, very helpful, as you might imagine, both from an aesthetic as well as um, inventory standpoint, and we're saving each of those for our archives along the way. Um, so let's begin this process. More masking tape <laughs> in, this, in this case. Uh, right on the surface of the painting, something that isn't incredibly uncommon. Uh, I think one question we get a lot at the museum is why we're still so determined to have the collection kept together. I think, first of all, that was his prerogative. There's nothing in an artist's credo that says you have to sell it all or, or give it away during your lifetime. Uh, although that's very common, I think a lot of estates uh, and foundations make it a point to have a body of work widely dispersed around the world. Still's um, idea was a little bit different in that he felt not just he, but all artists had the right to have their work shown without the distractions of other artists and in some depth. Um, a good analogy might be uh, you know, having to listen to multiple songs at the same time. When you go into a gallery space and confronted with sometimes very different things, um, it's often a competition for what gets your attention. Um, should we start with the unrolling itself? Most of the works you're going to see today, we know from our own records, will be later paintings. Uh, you can see that still, thankfully, to protect the integrity of the paint surfaces and the structure of those surfaces, rolled them with the paint on the outside, which is very good. That uh, paint would have cleaved or had cleavage if it would have been done in any other way. This one uh, looks like it has uh, three or four canvases on it. They're going to switch it in orientation now so you can see the image. This is a really interesting painting, something that I haven't seen uh, and want to spend some more time with. But Bailey, why don't you tell me your initial thoughts with this picture uh, as it's coming off the roll? I, <laughs> it's kind of catching me off guard. It's so different than anything we've seen before. Uh, this is, what, 72, I think? Is that right? Um, yeah, April, yeah, April of 1972. And I know that just because of what Emily was saying with the documentation that we have. Um, but just off first glance, the horizontal nature of this painting is so different. Uh, and it really, for me, it harkens back to a lot of the pastels that he was doing at the time. Kind That's the interesting. Colored ground, you know, he's working the entire canvas. So much of what we see at this time is he's using a lot of bare canvas. And mm -hmm. this is, not like that. I mean, certainly I'll, to amplify what Bailey said, the 70s and especially the early 70s were a very experimental time. He's uh, doing a number of new formats. We see these horizontal formats. Uh, we, we think of still as having these rising vertical forms or things coming down from the top, but it's interesting to see this more horizontal structure, um, sort of like the fire of hell coming yeah. up from the bottom. There's also two um, horizontal black Marks. I don't know how well you can see that uh, on your computer screens, but that's quite unusual in this rather typical black field of paint that he has these two horizontal striations, probably done with uh, his palette knife. Uh, and then a blue flame-like form in the center, and then again this fiery cauldron-like uh, flame-like uh, form coming down from the top. Um, it's a very wonderful painting and very difficult or different from what we think of in the 1970s where there's uh, fields of paint kind of breaking apart and yes, going off to the, um, the edges and things. Mm -hmm. uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of painted surface on this one. James, let's bring you in now. Yeah, there's, um, there are any number of pros and cons of having pi pictures rolled for this yes. long. Um, based on your first look, what do you see here? 
What I see actually is a great deal of common problems that we've seen throughout the remaining 228 roles, I think it is at this point. Uh, and what we're seeing, of course, as you saw earlier, was the adhesion of the masking tape to the surface of the painting, as you can see here and in these three spots. Uh, Pam and I will have to go in and mechanically remove that adhesive tape, and then whatever adhesive continues to be adhered to the canvas will have to probably remove that mechanically as well. Other two other immediate issues that I see are if you can see in the top central sort of U shape in the red up here, there's sort of a white haze associated around that area. And what that area that is a phenomenon called fatty acid bloom. It's basically a phenomenon of paint drying and it creates a white haze on the surface of the picture. So Pam and I will have to do some testing and determine its solubility and, and, and then therefore determine how to safely remove it from the surface. The third issue that immediately jumps out is the fact that the, these paints, paintings are still wet. Indeed, oil paint, one of its great strengths is the fact that it, had, it, it stays wet for a very, very long time. And we're seeing that in the section of the black uh, near me, the side closest to myself, where the tape, tape uh, strips are still adhered, is that it's sort of shiny and sort of, sort of dark. That's a, that, that is an indication that the paint is still physically drying here on this canvas. Why don't we start with the second one? Normally, again, we would be flipping this picture over, taking photographic documentation, both of the uh, verso and the recto, probably making uh, detailed shots of all the inscriptions, still put the pH number, the inventory number that they devise, dates and sizes on each of the canvases. Uh, but we'll get ready for a second picture off this same roll. Um, this might be a good time to give a shout out to Park Hill Elementary School, <laughs> who is uh, apparently uh, streaming this live themselves. I think it's the fifth grade class. Uh, but also we have another school, Dutch Creek Elementary, which I think is in a suburb, southwest suburb of Denver uh, called Littleton, who are also online with us. So thanks to, uh, instructors for taking the time and sharing this with your students. Uh, they're part of our Instill Gallery Experiences program. I've been to the museum a few times. Oh, we have a question from Park Hill Elementary. Or what, uh, intriguing minds want to know, are there any works in the collection that's still considered unfinished? Who wants to take that? <laughs> Bailey? Um, I don't think that we really know for sure, but that we have come across a handful, well, I guess two handfuls, ten paintings in the collection that uh, he did not given a uh, number two, and uh, we have speculation, you know, they're, they're pretty sketchy, and we can still see a lot of his pencil marks in those works, and so Dean and I have discussed the possibility that those are unfinished, and his daughter Sandra has said that that would definitely have been a possibility, that he always thought he was going to get back to him, and then just never did. We, we've shown one of these paintings in the galleries and we put next to the date possibly unfinished just to not uh, suggest something that we don't have complete certainty for. Um, the second one I believe is from the 70s as well. Yes, 1972 you can see a, probably you can't see an inscription right by Emily. And this one is um, maybe more typical to what we were talking about before, these rising forms coming up um, from the bottom and the yellow forms down from the top. Um, but there's some that looks a little different than what he might have done in the 50s, Bailey. Do you know what I'm referring to? Yes, yeah. The, one, the thing that catches me about this painting is just this particular blue. And James and Pam would know more specifically what color blue it is. Mm -hmm. Is it phthalo? Um, but we really start to see a lot of this in the 70s. Uh, in late 60s, there's a painting on view right now, actually, that I think is this color blue. But it's, it's my personal thing. It's somewhat typical in the 70s, too, that the painting starts out as one thing on the left side, and then it becomes something yeah. very different. It's like um, so it's not uncommon to have these you know, very spiky um, vertical forms. But the way it then becomes a field picture on the right yeah. is not atypical. Um, Pam, what do you see in terms of any conservation issues? Relatively speaking, to my um, eye, not quite as many problems in, in no, this picture. No, this one is actually in, in pretty good condition. We've got the tape the masking tape, which is not uncommon. And there are also some halos around the yellow where the oil medium has bled out and darkened over time. Um, 
But and not much we could do about that. That no, would have been something he probably not. could have anticipated even mixing his own paints, I think. Perhaps, yeah. But it has gotten darker since his since he last saw them. Staples from when he painted Absolutely. it, so he didn't take the time to remove those. He just rolled them up. Um, on to the next. What, what do you call that, a linter? The, uh, Instead of the cotton thread there from the edge of the canvas. You, you would be surprised what we've seen rolled up in these pictures. Um, maybe we'll still see some of it today. Uh, you know, uh, missing persons once in a while, but lots of barn debris and detritus, uh, wax paper, tin foil and things. Um, let's, see, let's see what we see in, uh, in the third one. <clears throat> if you didn't know, still, uh, for a number of practical as well as aesthetic reasons, mixed his own paints. He would buy large uh, drums of dry pigments, uh, many of which, a palette of which, came to the museum as part of our archives. Pam and James used that in their research as do other uh, people researching modern paint materials. Uh, but then he would probably cone those dry pigments into a big heap on his palette or onto some sort of um, surface, and then would boil the boiled linseed oil into that to mix his own paints, which allowed him to create a number of different thicknesses and viscosities and, and um, techniques that I think suggest that still was a master of oil, the oil painting method. Uh, this one is also from the 70s, I'm gonna venture to say 1972. And as we've been um, saying, uh, very, very stark in terms of its imagery, probably 40% of the canvas has paint on it, the rest of it is bare areas. Um, and the bare canvas works have their own challenges as well in terms of the rolling. Do, do you see any staining or things in this one this that one concerns you? This one does have you? some staining because it was rolled in this vertical way. These shapes have bled the oil into the bare areas of the canvas as it was drying. Ghost staining. So exactly. So you can see sort of the ghost of this form right here next to it right there, and that's about the width of the tube. So if you can picture that. This is also just such an interesting format. I don't, we're not able to turn this one like we did with the other. So you're looking at it sideways, but uh, it's almost it's one of these that I always think of as it like wants to be big, or if you see it from a long distance away, you think it's big, and then when you just knowing who the rest of this canvas is, this is like such a more intimate, large it scale. It is, yeah, almost ideas. medium yeah. scale for us. Exactly. It's interesting, too, typical for still the way these forms are coming in from the bare or the edges. Um, it always feels as if the painting you know, goes on ad infinitum. Mm -hmm. um, same in the lower. Uh, what I think is, the, you know, this is, oh yes, it's signed here. So I can say with certainty you now this is the bottom of the picture, right. but we've been fooled many times during this process. But uh, the way the lower right column has another passage that seemed essential for Still as he was uh, making it. Um, why don't we take another question while they bring, so that is the entire contents of the uh, third to the last row. We're gonna just keep going and show you as much as we can in our 20 or 25 minutes uh, that we have here. Um, another question we're getting, um, we have from Adrian, what is the hardest part of unrolling and cataloging such a vast body of work? Uh, you may have asked and answered some of that, the, the sheer size of the paintings makes it difficult. Um, you can see the tables are rolled out in one configuration that allow us to do certain of the paintings, paintings of a certain size. But as the pictures grew in uh, proportions over the 1950s and 60s, uh, just working with paintings that scale with just four people in the uh, room on each side of the table poses certain challenges. And then also the surprises as to what you, uh, what you might not expect. We recently had a canvas uh, unrolled that we weren't able to re-roll. There was such lifting paint uh, in the center of it that we have had to re-roll it from the edges into a scroll and deal with that at a later date so we could finish with the, um, the remaining, uh, remaining uh, works on that roll. James, would you answer that differently? Any other challenges in such a large collection? Certainly we're, an, we're a museum that's open, so we're doing other work too, trying to get exhibitions ready. Um, deal with you know schedules and meetings. What, what Schedule, comes to mind? I think it's, it's the sheer physicality of it is actually uh, very challenging because in some cases the larger pictures, for example, are about nine feet by thirteen feet tall, nine feet high by thirteen feet wide. Pardon me, and often we'll have two or three canvases, or that amount of canvas on one roll. And so when we're back rolling these, the first painting off these, 
these large canvases. The canvas is very, very help, uh, heavy, and we're trying not to create creases when we're back rolling. So it becomes really challenging from a coordination perspective to do it. Or just oh. flipping one over, yeah. too. You know, what sounds like a rather simple, um, simple exercise can be very difficult when it's a 9 by 13 painting. Uh, why don't we start with this one? <laughs> yeah, looks looks pretty good to me. I hope you can see some of the colors and, and nuances of something like this, a very dramatic, kind of classic still image. Oh, this one's quite wow. tall, too. <laughs> Even though this is you know, sort of medium size for still, I have to admit, um, they're usually large horizontals. This would be the bottom, we can tell by the signature here. It's a 1975 painting. Um, but oftentimes they were almost cinematic in their horizontality. This one um, expresses the more uh, taller than square verticals that uh, he was also known for. Bailey, what strikes you about this image? Just the energy. I, I, it just harkens to a lot of what we were saying. The, that first one we enrolled was lacking in terms of their utilization of the bare canvas, the frenzy of palette knife strokes kind of these rising forms instead of the horizontal forms. Uh, this is, like Dean said, kind of more what we would expect. Tell me about all these vertical forms on a vertical format, too, makes it even more pronounced. Um, gothic might even be a, a, a term you could apply to something like this. And all the um, highlights, I mean, bits of green, yes. um, there's a sort of orange-red in the bare passage between the maroon and, and reds. Um, gosh, what else? Um, yellow used very discreetly, just coming down from the center, sort of like a a slice or a crevice, yeah, in related to certain drawings and other paintings we have. Um, but a very, I think as Bailey pointed out, there's something about the late work that seemed to have a new energy and a new um, sort of inner force. There's much more action and much more force, I think, in some of the uh, later work, uh, where a lot of the force comes from the, the impacted layers of paint and the way he applied it. There's more, I think, implied movement. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, flame-like is how often uh, I see these. Um, should we go have another uh, go at one? Hope you're seeing this okay. Uh, why don't we take another question? Has there been an order in the um, sequence of the rolls? That's actually a really good question. Um, we tended to do the smaller canvases first um, because the rolls are normally stored vertically uh, in the uh, original condition. We can't store them vertically after we re-roll them because they uh, need to be uh, held horizontal. But the small roll canvases uh, on uh, small canvases on rolls would take up as much room as the large canvases, so we could get rid of a number of rolls by dealing with those smaller paintings. Um, also, the early work, the 20s, 30s, and even the early 40s, uh, we only had about 100 or 125 canvases, so we had a greater need in the galleries to show that unknown aspect of Still's work. Uh, and then I think the exhibition loads, the curators, various guest curators, um, Bailey, myself, David Anfam, our senior consulting curator, had needs for specific things. So we were forced to go find them on individual roles and perhaps just stretch the one we needed for a show and re-roll the others for future use. Um, this one is uh, upside down to the camera. Not a problem for us from an inventory perspective, but for those of you, if you could turn your computer screens upside down, you'll get a better appreciation for it. Another kind of classic, I think, 70s, uh, 70s kind of image. Uh, not so different from the one we had, but a little, a little brushier in a way. The forms seem a little looser to my eye. Um, it doesn't have the same taut sort of energy of the previous one. Uh, and again, 1975, so this is really the last four years of Still's painting career, um, the last painting state from 1979, although drawings will go into the first few months of 1980. Um, anything else you can see, Bailey, from your perspective? This one and the uh, last one really, to me, just look almost, they look forward a couple years there. 1977 was, I don't know why, there's several paintings in that year that this really reminds me of the, the bird painting, we call it, mm -hmm. that blue with the um, exploding blue forms, and this kind of reminds me of that, just compression and then explosion of energy. Uh, like Dean said, the smaller, it's almost like he used a smaller palette knife, so it's a lot sketchier. Um, 
Here again on black and two different blues. Mm -hmm. James or Pam, do you? This one again looks pretty fresh to me. I see one problem here. You well, yes. might want to touch on that. There, there are two. I mean, two quick things that I'm seeing. The first is what Dean was describing, which is what we describe as the lack of tacking edge, and that's the edge of canvas right at, at the edge of, uh, that we would norm. What we normally would do to stretch this work is we would pull along that and then staple into that edge. Because we don't have a large tacking edge here, we don't have a lot to pull, pull on. So we would add an additional canvas strip, adhere an additional canvas strip to this edge, and then use that to pull against. And then subsequently staple that onto the reverse of the new custom stretcher that we will have ordered for this work. Uh, the other thing that, the other aspect of it that I'm looking at very quickly, and it speaks to, it, it's a constant reminder of the fact that all of these works have been in storage for 20, 40 years or so, some of which have never seen the light of day, and, and thus they've changed in different ways. One of the ways that I think this picture has changed, in, but we're still not quite sure around what Still's intention was around it, was there's a, uh, the light and dark shift that is happening in this red passage of what is the right edge, the proper right edge of the work. There's these odd sort of vertical lines in here that suggest that this darkening probably was not original. It's a function of drying that has occurred while it has been rolled. So there's going to be some additional research that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to do some materials research, understanding the, the nature of the oil medium he used and the pigments he used in order to extrapolate uh, Clifford Still's original intent as it comes to uh, interpreting this small passage. Um, one point that we maybe haven't driven home as much as we could is everything we're seeing today is not only the first time we're seeing it, but none of these paintings were exhibited <clears throat> during his lifetime. So you're seeing them for the first time too. Uh, we can smell the oil medium in the room. That is often um, the case when we unroll, particularly these later canvases. Uh, this was probably worked on maybe over the course of a few days or weeks, but then re-rolled uh, and dispensed with so he could continue to work in his relatively small uh, studio, which was a barn studio. Uh, but again, the fact that most of what we've been seeing has never been seen by anyone since the artist made it, and I think that's also been some of the um, excitement in this work that we've been doing is uh, trying to understand and learn how each painting fits into this large and really complex puzzle, admittedly complex puzzle. Uh, that's it for the second row. Yes. Well, I, I um, hate to take us already to the end of uh, our work, but this is the last roll. This is actually the last yeah. one to be inventory. It's a little moving for each, each of us, uh, but what do we know about this one? I, I'm not sure if there's any notations on the back. Stand by you. I think it was 1977. 1977. Oh, so this is a very late. He would have been 73, 74 years old when he made this painting. Um, one thing I should let you know is we have a very useful online collection that you can get to from our website or simply log on at collection.cliffordstillmuseum.org where we have how many paintings now, Bailey, um, online? Um, Four or five hundred? Um, <laughs> I don't even have... <laughs> She's very good. Uh, those images are zoomable. You can download them for your own uh, use and study. Um, we're adding more works as we photograph them. Uh, so please uh, take a, a moment and you can sort and search and find those um, experimental works or some of the classic, uh, classic favorites. Um, also, if you're in the Denver area, we opened in September an exhibition curated by Clifford Still's youngest of two daughters, Sandra Still Campbell, a wonderful presentation of works from uh, the 1940s through the uh, last, very last painting he made, but also, uh, I think, a certain emphasis on the later work, uh, much of what we're seeing um, today. We were wondering how we should leave you with this last picture. Uh, they're going to do more work the rest of the afternoon as uh, you go back to your lives. <laughs> but uh, I think maybe the best thing we should do is just uh, enjoy this last role in silence.
So with that, number 831, the end of six, seven plus years of work. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to the fabulous team who have put their hearts and souls into this project. Please come to the museum uh, at the corner of 13th and Bannock Street in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and again, thank you for tuning in today. This will reside on our Facebook page probably forever, as long as there's a Facebook. So share it with your friends, share it with your family, and uh, please make a point of visiting the museum. And with that, we'll send you off with goodbye. <laughs>